This is uh, Puppets in the Green Mountain, the last of our live broadcasts, live streams of um, Access and the Arts Dialogue. Once again, moderated by John Potter. Uh, John, you'll introduce uh, Melody as we begin. Uh, the subject today is uh, community art spaces. What does it do for the artists? What does it do for the community? What does it do for the field? Um, we just want to welcome you. And let's begin. Thank you. So I'm John Potter. I am the executive director of the Latches Theater, which just celebrated its 80th birthday yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> Plug over. Um, <laughs> We are proud to be a, 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 a theater, but we also do think of ourselves a little bit as a, a community art space. We also house artist studios and uh, uh, studio spaces, and we have an art gallery, uh, and we certainly work um, across all kinds of uh, media and genre, so um, we're not exactly um, you know, an artist uh, community or colony, but we, we, do, have, um, we do have some uh, sympathetic feelings and, and, and work that we do. Um, in doing um, some research for this gathering, I, I must say it's a little hard to navigate what people are thinking about artist colonies and artist spaces. Uh, one article I read uh, tipped its hand with a headline reading, Whatever Happened to Artist Colonies? And what followed was a snarkily cynical article which included such comments as, To have art colonies, you have to have artists as outcasts, and artists aren't outcasts anymore. Why would artists want to hang out with one another? or have a puppet festival or something like that. <laughs> Another more fair-minded writer writing about an artist colony in Seattle wrote, you can't put an exact price on an encounter with an artist toiling away in a studio or greeting guests at an open house. The alchemy of urban vitality isn't easy to track, but no doubt a street full of empty buildings is a lot less worth visiting. Um, a still more enthusiastic advocate in touting the role the arts can play in community revitalization, economic development, and in reversing the trends of out-migration and the exodus of younger people, urged people to think of the arts first. The arts and art making are not the dessert, but are a key part of the meal. Since I love a good meal, I lean toward the last comment. Um, today we're going to examine the topic of enriching communities through the development of artist spaces in Taiwan and Vermont. With us today is Jiayin Zheng, who is the co-founder and artistic director of Taiwan's The Puppet and Its Double Theater. In 2013, she also started the ambitious project to set up the Liza Puppet Art Colony, renovating old, ice bar old rice barns into an international laboratory for puppet arts. Uh, also with us is Robert McBride, the founder of the Rockingham Arts and Museum Project right up the road in Bellows Falls. It's a project which is committed to integrating artists and the arts into the long-term sustainability of his home community. He is also an artist and serves on more boards of directors and steering committees than anyone in his right mind ought to. <laughs> Most of them focused on the creative economy, cultural heritage and preservation, and the arts and community and development. So welcome to you both. Thank you. And why don't we start with Jiayin and uh, your project, and I understand you have a slideshow to go with it, so yeah. we'll just uh, let you go. Hello, I'm Jiayin. I come from Taiwan, yes, um, and I co-founded Puppet Estable Theater, and so uh, first forgive me because English is not, not my native language, but I will try my best, yes. And uh, today I have uh, the other staff with me, help me. It's our lighting designer and Luis, our technical director, yes. So maybe they can also jump in and uh, give you some ideas what we are working on. And so uh, my company was uh, founded in 1909, yeah. And uh, at, at uh, right back, so 1909, we had a big, very big earthquake uh, at September 21st. So we were founded uh, when I finished study at UConn Puppetry Program, and I was back uh, 
in the beginning of September, so that same month. And I founded the company with some friends, but uh, immediately the earthquake happened. That was a big one, and about 2,000 people died. Mm -hmm. So we stopped all the plans and events we're going to do for that same year. Then my colleague and I would just quickly throw all the pockets I built at UConn and uh, take uh, luggage with me just to, uh, we have uh, some uh, projects sponsored by like universities or foundations that artists can go to the earthquake area to uh, help cheer up the children. But uh, at that time we didn't have any show yet. But my colleague and I, but we, we know each other because we work in another theater a long time ago. We know each other well. So we just <laughs> took out all the puppets and made up something <laughs> and uh, some improvisation between us and also get response from children. In. So it was a wonderful experience. Like uh, uh, the audience and uh, the puppeteer, we all uh, interact and improvise at the same time and create something live and different each time. So uh, that project, that kind of project uh, stayed last about two or three years after that. So we constantly went back to the mid Taiwan where the earthquake was and uh, did something like that, workshop for schools. And uh, so besides our formal theater production, doing workshops is always a very important part for my company. And also, the, uh, before we set up the company, there was only like traditional, uh, we, you can only see puppets in the traditional hand puppet styles or a children's theater. <coughs> there are not, there are not, not no contemporary puppet company back then. So uh, at the same time, we want to learn from Western countries and so we also invited many international artists to give workshops or to give shows in Taiwan. And uh, we were based in Taipei for like uh, 14 years before we moved to countryside, to Yilan. So we set up Lizhe Party Art Com uh, Colony there. Mm -hmm. And uh, we moved there now for five years. Mm -hmm. So. Through the first four years, we have all the renovations going on between rice. Deep, uh, we have three rice farms, and now last year we renovate a fourth floor building. So through all the four years, we had uh, many, many re renovations going on, and we have to shift things back and forth between spaces. So that was a very painful time, and at the same time, we're doing a lot of still doing a lot of touring shows around Taiwan and also went to like uh, festival, uh, festi uh, festivals internationally, yes. And uh, so uh, the, the, you, you saw Mr. Ruraru's yard, the, the show we presented here. So that is the very, uh, that was the very first show we created since we moved to the countryside. So it's like a contribution to move it from the very big city. We were in Taipei, the capital city of Taiwan, very crowded, very busy. Mm -hmm. And uh, so Mr. Rura Rusia is like a contribution to, to our new life in the countryside. <laughs> so yes, so we try to stay uh, in, in more, more in the nature and uh, do different things. And so now, uh, before uh, we were in Taipei, we were in a very small apartment. We always have to shift things back and forth when we build puppets. Sometimes we have to rehearse, sometimes we build puppets, sometimes we have to rent a place to rehearse. But now we have a very uh, uh, well-equipped place for puppeteers. We have a carpenter's workshop, sewing room, we have a perform. Uh, rehearsal studios, which we can do simple shows and host some present presentations. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so we, we constantly do workshops in our co art colony. And uh, 
we, we also like we have a uh, event <laughs> like a uh, open day like open weekend so people can uh, come in we have a like art market we invited our they were originally like a theater designers but we make them maybe you do something for don't stay in the small theater come out come that make something for art fair diff experience diff different style um, I think uh, we moved to Leeds uh, that's a very small village very quiet village but uh, actually Leeds uh, was a seaport back to 100 years ago it was a very prosperous uh, trade center yet yeah, and uh, but because later the the, full, uh, the trade center moved more to the land because of the train train uh, transportation, so the seaport slowly declined, and now it's a very very quiet village. Like uh, I think about <coughs> two or three hundred people there, and most of them are senior people. So for them, we are very weird people <laughs> <laughs> because we. We are not, because they I think they know each other in the village so we are strange faces for them but so so whenever they see strange faces they, they say oh that must be from the puppy, <laughs> puppy art colony or they see some foreign faces uh, peeping around looking around they, they will point Oh, you! I know you're looking for. <laughs> <laughs> if they saw some artists got lost, like a Western faces got lost, they will point, <laughs> point to, to our colony, and uh, yeah, and uh, and we also send like artists to schools and communities very often, and uh, starting from. Um, Two years ago, we started artists in residence program. We, we, we started to try to host international artists to uh, live in our colony. We have uh, artist accommodation, so they live there and uh, uh, stay about one month to one and a half months, and they can got to create uh, some project they want. And we, in my company, we have a puppeteer, so. Uh, there will be someone always that can assist them or discuss with them and uh, um, we, we found it is a very strong program and enrich the art colony a lot um, like uh, this year we are hosting artists from Romania from Italy mm -hmm. yeah, from Hungary and mm -hmm. from Thailand and they all do different styles of puppetry and uh, we open the presentation to the public and also uh, we collect money from general public but it's free for the neighbors it's free and and i must say this is something they never seen before because they are more people the villagers there and they're more acquainted with the like taiwanese opera like traditional opera style or traditional hand puppets but they never see something like very innovative, uh, creative thing. And uh, what's nice about it is uh, some of the artists, they create shows out of our local uh, stories or our local legend stories. So for the villagers there, they really feel touched to see someone from different country doing our own uh, stories from our own culture. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and uh, yeah, and also starting from last year, we we hosted Leeds uh, International Puppet Festival. So Eric, the the Saint Glass Theater was in our very first uh, festival, and this year we will invite them back to do uh, a Shoshana solo show. When I put on your glove, and we are happy. Yeah, so we. After our trip back to Taiwan, we're going to prepare for the festival and host them back <laughs> to uh, give, give them back from the hospi uh, hospitality we receive here. So I, 
it's a, I feel it's a very very nice to have the space so people can meet <laughs> artists can meet and uh, I, I feel although the the, the past uh, the everything, the, all the renovation and the fundraising thing were very like <laughs> headache. But I, I still, I'm very very happy about what we are doing now, and uh, uh, it's I think it's yeah <laughs> yeah. Sometimes we do like a puppeteer training. We force them to go into community <laughs> and react to people because sometimes puppeteers tend to be very shy. They like to stay behind. This, the 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 booth. So we say, oh, you should go out and <laughs> see how people react to the puppet, and then your puppet will grow the character. Yes. Mm -hmm. And we now we have a, a small exhibi exhibition there. When Eric was there, this this part hasn't uh, finished yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. The, this building was still under construction. So you will also see something new. <laughs> yeah, can't wait. Yeah, and uh, yeah, and uh, also we are not uh, we we yeah we are not thinking that we want to change uh, the community. We're thinking we want to just open the space so the villagers also can join us, and uh, we uh, we always invited the elders to. Like to teach us tradi uh, like traditional how to make traditional food, mm -hmm. or like a needle work or uh, knitting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. and uh, I feel it's a very uh, I, nice, yeah, nice communication. Yeah, with them, but it it takes time because in in the very beginning we are very separate mm -hmm. from the community. But since we moved there for five years, and they gradually as Acceptance being there because in the beginning they thought this just temporary thing. They didn't think some people from the big city will stay there and uh, build art there and be part of the community. So yeah, and uh, also starting from this year because all the spaces were finished and we try to move our focus from. Uh, doing more touring, theater, theatrical shows, to more to the that on-site event, and uh, yeah, and uh, try to stay there longer. In, in the past, we tend to travel a lot, yeah, to do shows. But uh, starting from this year, we shift focus that we do more events there, so people come to us. Yes, yeah. yeah. So I think that's. For now, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. that, that's great. I, I'm curious. Uh, mm -hmm. At the very beginning, um, was there resistance from um, people in the village or in the community um, uh, to to your idea at first? And, and if so, how did you how did you work with, with that and overcome that? Yes, in the beginning, yes, because this space was deserted like uh, almost twenty years, mm -hmm. so. Villagers are using it as storage, mm -hmm. or they mm -hmm. did their they hand their laundry <laughs> <laughs> or park their cars in the, this space. So suddenly they couldn't use it. Uh, we rented this place from a farmers union because it was rice farms. Yes. yes. So, but we we try to be. We try to be nice. <laughs> we sometimes during the holidays we gave them some gifts, mm -hmm. or uh, we try to uh, knock door to door, speak to them. Oh, we going to have a show. You like to watch? But in the beginning, we have very few, very few people they were willing to come. But I think that this year, mm -hmm. because we finished all the center, it looked nice now mm -hmm. because it wasn't look so nice. Before, because it was under construction, mm -hmm. so and we also have a, like illustration book library, so children can just come in mm -hmm. and look, read the books. So yeah, we we, we were trying pretty hard <laughs> to get them step into the the place, but once they got in, they 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 like it uh -huh. and they they come back. 
Yes, and, and because more, the young people, they all move to city, they sometimes they visit their parents during mm -hmm. holidays. Mm -hmm. They were like very surprised. I didn't know my hometown become like this. Mm -hmm. and because they are young generation with children. So like, oh, I want to come back more often. Mm -hmm. yes. mm -hmm. I'm sure that makes them feel great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I appreciate um, uh, hearing, I mean, it does feel like you um, did the right things and many of the right things to, to build the bridges to the community. And I love the idea of having um, having them come in and teach cooking and teach, um, and teach what they know uh, and... Um, and one, oh, also one thing, that first they were suspicious mm -hmm. because uh, it was like a, the whole county was like a, a tourist spot. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. there's some, maybe some business or commercial benefit. Mm -hmm. They wonder if we, we, we can there because we can earn a lot of money mm -hmm. and uh, they, they will lose the business. So at the beginning, some people were suspicious of us. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. But later, they realized they're just poor artists. <laughs> <laughs> they couldn't do any harm to us. <laughs> I think we'll um, turn to Robert and hear, um, hear about what he's done. Um, I'm perceiving a lot of common threads. Um, but if you could tell us about um, the Rock AM Arts and Museum sure. Project and the Exner block. Uh, and your work there. Yeah, yeah. And I think Shane touches on many points about the organic nature of something developing, the amount of time it takes for something to develop. And uh, I basically describe myself as an invasive weed <laughs> that just keeps popping up in situations. I uh, came to Bellows Falls because of a dinner party. I was living in Manhattan and I came up to a dinner party in 1981 that was being hosted by a, uh, a friend of a friend of mine at what was then the Andrews Inn, which was a gay inn in downtown Bellows Falls in 19, from about 1977 to 83. There was a one in Brattleboro, there wasn't a gay meeting place in Burlington. It was like, how did this happen in Bellows Falls, Vermont? And um, that's another story, which we happen to be telling the story of with HB here and different people. But I came up for a dinner party with three other people. It was great, you met all these people, I had a great time, stayed overnight, and I bought a house. Um, <laughs> <laughs> looking for property, I had never been to Vermont in my life, but I loved downtown Bellows Falls. It, all the stores were open, the steel bridges. It was like this really like working class place. I said, this? This is a very cool place. So I was walking around the town that next morning, and up the street there was a little house for sale. And I went back to three of my friends that had come up and said, we should buy this house. <laughs> so we called the number. She said, well, there's a contract on it. So we went into town and bought trinkets, and we buried them on the property. And at the end of the week, the house was available, and we bought it. <laughs> and I think I came up very infrequently uh, from New York, I wasn't looking to transplant here. I was looking for a place to get out of New York once in a while. And then over the years, I spent more time, we were all in our 20s, other partners sold out to do other things with their lives. And I ended up owning the house in the mid 90s. And after that time, I'd been in New York 25 years and I was ready for a change and I moved up to Bellows Falls. And at that point when I moved there, it was like then I was ready to say, I'm now part of this community. How can I help contribute? things to the community with the background I have in the arts. Mm -hmm. And in New York City, I'd been there and the, moved there in the 1970s, and it was a great time to be in New York. It was vital, the apartments were cheap, the city was going bankrupt, <laughs> and you had a lot of opportunity to really work. Plus, I was also in my 20s, and anywhere in your 20s is probably a great time in your life to explore things. I was also fortunate enough to put together a space on the Lower East Side of Manhattan called PS 122. And that was um, just a lovely experience. It still exists. We were the painters. We brought in the performers. They're the ones that have really put the place on the map. And it, that was a great place to work out of. So I sort of came from this place of being used to working with other artists, having other artists in a building that you could rely on and work with. And um, the, by the time I came to Vermont in the, the mid-1990s, Bellows Falls was very different. All the stores had closed down. I would say 70% of the downtown was vacant, and upstairs and retail spaces. 
So I kind of just rolled up my sleeves and said, let's just start doing stuff with the arts. You know, let's do some smoke and mirrors, let's use the press, let's bring in some quality things. Bubbles Falls was not a town that was known for the arts. Um, and we, and just, I seem to have the capacity, I seem to have vision, but I have the, the uh, knack to meet people that have capacity. And, um, and I think that's where my invasive weedness comes in. <laughs> uh, that I would just show up all kinds of meetings of the state on Amtrak, on this and that. And people would just say, you know, who is this guy from Bellows Falls that thinks it's great? Because at that point, Bellows Falls was kind of known as an armpit in Vermont and not known for anything. And I had the great um, fortune to meet Andy Broderick, who was president of Housing Vermont at the time, a statewide housing organization. And the Exner Block, which is a building in downtown Bellows Falls, which now provides uh, affordable housing for 10 artists and six retail spaces, was coming up for auction. He was interested in buying it. He met me at a select board meeting and asked me if I would help work on the development of that building and what my vision was. And I said to create affordable housing for artists. So, because um, I do experience that thing where artists mostly go to a community take the lousy places, fix it up, and then gentrification sets in and they move on. And uh, that's not the biggest fear I have in Bellows Falls is gentrification. Um, but I do believe that artists should have a place in a community and not have to just move on. Now I have fights with Charlie Hunter in town about this concept. Charlie's a great painter and music develop, develop, uh, entrepreneur that believes that that is the focus of artists, to be like these kind of beetles, these dung beetles that get in and get things going, and then, you know, the community can move on, so we kind of joke about that. But having just said all of that, I am um, first person to say that uh, I'd like to expand the conversation from the concept of artists to creatives, creativity, and people functioning creatively creatively in whatever they do. I've met some of the most creative plumbers and the least creative artists. And I think if we can broaden our vocabulary to look at creativity and its application, that that's very important. I also don't want Bubbles Falls to be known as an artist community. I would like it to be a community that artists feel comfortable living in, but they're part of that community with all the other people, the seniors, the this, they create energy but they have respect for it and they're not shoving anyone else out and um, it's a broader, broader kind of uh, community to be in. And I think that if any of you have been to Bellows Falls over the last 25 years, you might sense some of that development. The downtown feels good. The people that seem to be attracted to doing things are kind of pioneers and entrepreneurial. The sheep can come when they're ready and that's great. But I think uh, Bellows Falls, the same way it appealed to me when I went there in 1981, there was just something that got my little antenna going. And I was like, I like this place. And I think the other people, Michael Bruna, who opened the antique store, Gary Smith, who's done Popolo Restaurant, the Wonder Bar people, all had that similar kind of reaction to this community, that sort of sense of something that could happen here that wasn't just economically planned out. And I also think another successful thing of the community is that if I look at eight or 10 of the businesses in the downtown, they're all run by people under 35 years of age. They own the buildings, and that's the exact kind of economic development, you know, the Brattleboro Development Credit Corporation is looking for, the concept we're losing youth, how do you bring youth in? And I think Bellows Falls is a wonderful example of people coming to the community that are investing in it and bringing in the next generation to come. Um, so yeah, I, I'm more of an arts advocacy organization. I have put on programming per se, but I look at the concept of housing, making art accessible to not culturally and physically to people. Um, I host a TV program called Everyday People so we can interview people making a difference in our communities. Sometimes they're artists, sometimes it's social service, you know, but how do we just kind of tell the stories of our community in the broadest sense? Uh, I also host Artist Town Meetings quarterly, where we reach out to artists, artisans, and local food people, because with food, you're actually eating the culture, 
And um, sometimes 15 people show up, sometimes 40, but we just have a conversation together and sometimes an agenda of moving things forward. So I think it's really important to keep people physically in touch with each other. You know, the more we get into the digital communication, and it's, it's fantastic, and it is fantastic, and out. Um, people do want to be in a room with one another, you know? Ultimately, we are sort of tribal, and people do want to be in a room, and there's no kind of um, substitution for that, sharing a meal, the very basic thing of sharing a meal together. So that's kind of an overview of where RAMP is and what it's done. I'm thrilled that people in the community are doing things. There's people doing stuff with the arts that have never heard of my organization in Bellows Falls. And I think that's fantastic, you know. I don't get involved with saying you should have seen it when I moved here. It's more like, great, how can we support what you're doing? Because this is really what we want to see growing. And it seems to be doing its organic thing. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, I think right now, uh, Bellas Falls is a place that um, its reality and its reputation are not in a line and people are judging it by what it used to be or thinking what it, thinking about it in the way it used to be as, a, as the way it is now. Um, yeah. And I think um, hopefully those can line up. Um, but it's kind of nice to have that, that mode around us too. I mean, still that, we wanted to buy a house in Bellows Falls, but we didn't do it. And it was like, great, you know, Charlie Hunter came up with this great t-shirt slogan years ago, Bellows Falls, not nearly as bad as you thought. <laughs> um, did you encounter any um, resistance from the local community or if not resistance at least you know um, glances askance at, uh, at your at your crazy idea and I'm also intrigued at the um, notion of doing a, um, a project with housing involved and but having that housing dedicated uh, as artist spaces and um, whether there was any um, difficulty uh, in achieving that and funding that based on the fact that, that you know, it had that particular sort of designation. Mm. Um, so if you could talk about um, the process of getting, getting well, that, that vision enacted. Right. Well, that was really all through meeting, um, I said, I met this guy, Andy Broderick, who was the head of housing Vermont. Um, and no, there's no problem with that. It's federal affordable housing. Um, it's not hard to have a, a targeted uni. You have projects they do that are for people over 55 years of age. And that's fine, and it can be with a preference given to mm -hmm. artists. So basically what happens, I don't manage the Exner block, Stuart Property Management Company manages it. What they do is when an apartment becomes available, they let me know, and I, they give me about 30 days to reach out to my artist community to see if there's an artist that would meet those affordable housing guidelines. And in Wyndham County, uh, an individual can, I think, earn up to about $27,500 a year to qualify for affordable housing. But um, it's not a subsidy they get, it's just that your, your income allows you to do that you still pay rent in the building. Yeah. But we do accept vouchers like Section 8 vouchers or something, that's our problem. So there was no kind of problem with making it uh, a target audience or, or preference given to artists. If I don't find an artist in that time, then they can go down their list of affordable housing people and fill the apartment with that. Currently we have about eight of the 10 apartments filled with artists, three jazz musicians, painters, graphic designers, and stuff like that. And the apartment rents run, and heat included, they're all one bedrooms for about between $500 and $700 a month. Mm -hmm. And do you have a sense of the um, artists who are living there um, deriving inspiration and connection with one another? Um, I mean, is, is it functioning, if not as a colony, at least as a connecting, connecting place? Yeah, what's well, really been interesting, we opened the building in 2000, and um, it, it's a different, it, the populations of artists just shift. Basically, when you go through the affordable housing program, it's for a year lease. And um, so it's not like a short term, we can't do residencies in and out of there or anything mm -hmm. in terms of artist things. But it's a year lease, and sometimes it's been young people, some people have gone on to buy homes in town, or just you know, moved on to other projects where they moved around the country. Right now I'd say uh, a lot of our artists are probably over 55 or 60, mm -hmm. and it's kind of neat that these people have come, they kind of at this point in their life realize the value of living in the downtown, a walkable community, and also the idea of being in touch with artists in the same building. Mm -hmm. So you can just knock on someone's door 
and can I can you look at my work? You know, having that connection. Mm -hmm. We run a not-for-profit little gallery in the lobby area, which we sometimes show work of the artists, but have different kinds of art um, exhibits come in, and anyone is perfectly willing to approach me to see if it might be appropriate to have an exhibit in the space there about that. I don't know if I answered your question. Completely. Uh, one of the things that interests me is that um, both of you migrated from the city to a rural area. And I'm curious if uh, you miss being in the city. Um, what do you miss about it? Um, and what, um, what have you gained by being in the rural area and making that journey? We'll start with you, yeah. Kai Yes. And I was born in Taipei and grew up in Taipei. I'm a very, very city person. <laughs> <laughs> so and, uh, when I moved to, but I really, because I really found a good place to work, in coffee tree, so we moved to countryside. In the in the beginning, I s every time I saw little insects or <laughs> spiders, I scream. <laughs> <laughs> then I thought, oh, oh, it's too tired because there are so many spiders. <laughs> <laughs> so I, now I see spiders. Oh, oh hello, spiders! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that really happened to me, and uh, I I and I think. I always enjoy watching uh, theater, but the, for that you have to go to big cities because in countryside there are not that many things happening there. But in the beginning, I tend to go back to Taipei like uh, every uh, like every weekend to watch shows. Mm -hmm. Then now less and less, maybe uh, uh, twice a month, now like once a month. So it's a I. I go back to city less and less, and uh, now I really enjoy to create like a really, um, because gradually I found when I watch show in the city, they are like uh, the most trendy uh, international company brought by our national theater. I, I enjoy it, but it uh, somehow feels strange because it's separate from daily life. Mm. Oh, especially from the uh, the, the, the general uh, Taiwanese people who are not living in the city, it's a very separate <coughs> from that. And I started to enjoy more like create art uh, with the community. So it's not art is not only theater or only music or it's dance. Or it's like everything together: food, um, singing. <coughs> Tree. Everything happened at the same time. I, now I feel I like it more that way. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. I think that aligns with uh, Robert's vision of creativity, um, you know, existing in, um, in, in every life and in every part of life, and um, not just a, in, in an artist, a self-defined artist, but it, it is around, um, uh, around in what we eat and what we do and, and who we interact with. And, uh, any, any, any regrets? Yeah. I, no, no, not at all. I mean, I, I grew up in San Francisco, Bay Area, went to school in Berkeley, and moved to New York in 75 to go to graduate school. Thought I'd be there two years, go back to the Bay Area where I'd always been and loved, and fell in love with New York and never went back. Um, so I really had, and just, I, I've always liked the concept of cities and the, and the action and, the, and the, where you're being around. And then, you know, when I moved up to Bellows Halls full time, I sort of thought, Oh, what's it going to be like? I and mean, I guess I'll go to Brattleboro more to see things or stuff. Mm -hmm. And then got right into the pace that there is so much going on up here. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I also originally, when I bought my house in England, I would come to Bell's Falls to get out of New York. Ironically, now I go to New York to relax, <laughs> to get out of Bell's Falls because I'm so busy and there's so much activity. And you're, you know, you know, so it's. You know, I go down to New York and I, you know, I see a few things, but I'm not, um, and yes, there are the quality of certain kinds of exhibits you're not going to see, and I'll go see those. But there's, we live in such a rich culture in Southeastern Vermont, and we're just in the middle of this international puppet festival, which you're not going to see anywhere else, of top quality work. You know, when you go to concerts and you see uh, things like the Stone Church Arts, where Eugene Friesen, my play, teaches at the Berkeley School of Music, you can actually go up to the artist after and talk to them. Mm -hmm. You're not gonna be able to do that at a concert in New York City. Um, and I think what I always try to remind people of living in Vermont or Southeastern Vermont with you know, Massachusetts, New Hampshire right by, you know, 
the scale of Vermont allows us to be involved in our communities. There's 600,000 people, 620 in the whole state. You can roll up your sleeves and make a difference and get involved, which is much more difficult in a big city if you don't have a certain kind of connections or collaborations. And um, I think whether you want to run for office, whether you want to start an arts organization, whatever, you know, there's that opportunity. And I think that makes Vermont a very, very, very special place. So um, I can't, no, I, you know, totally busy. There's always something great to see. And the, and the quality of what we have here is, is really top notch. Could you, could you speak a little bit about how the, um, the colony has um, uh, informed your art and um, uh, enhanced and enriched uh, creation of other, of, of other art? What has it meant to gather people together and um, you know, perhaps um, stir new new creations. Can you talk about? Uh, I think that part most come from our artists in residence program mm -hmm. because we, I think there are very very few places that only focus like an artist colony or artist village only focus on poppy tree, mm -hmm. and uh, <coughs> we uh, we got about twenty applications last year, mm -hmm. but. Uh, and, uh, I found now a day they, they people are doing less and less the physical puppets. They doing more object or video art. Mm -hmm. So for now, I tend to choose people still doing, mm -hmm. still build puppets and mm -hmm. express through the physical puppets mm -hmm. uh, more. I think in this uh, this coming few years, but of course in the future mm -hmm. when we have more funding, we can add in more like avant-garde or cutting edge things. And uh, I think when, when the artists, puppeteers arrived at our colony, they were like, this is like a paradise. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> paradise for puppeteer because usually people will just work at their house in, on a small table. And, uh, and I think there are so many solo artists in Europe yeah, they always work alone, mm. but the, here is like a big family. Mm. They get mm. to chat to people and uh, feel different culture. And uh, it surprised us and the artists that how much you can uh, reach in one month. Because, mm. because uh, they were working in a very mm. difficult situation, worrying about all the things they don't have space. But mm. now because they are provided by all the equipment, tools, and materials, mm. like we have walls of drawers and drawers of different kind of materials. So they can reach very, very far in one month. So we were very surprised about their presentation because we didn't expect that much. Mm. Yeah. I think that because they, they uh, were used to work in very bad circumstances. <laughs> so <laughs> when they reach the puppy paradise, they can really work very fast because <laughs> everything is handy. And uh, mm, like, I think it's also brought a lot of opportunity that we can cooperate uh, with the artists more, like in the coming years. Like uh, the two years ago, there was an uh, artist from Mexico. She's so good, so we invited her back with her uh, uh, founder, co-founder of the company, the two people from Mexico back last year. Mm -hmm. And this year, we're hosting four of them back, mm -hmm. and we are doing Mother Courage. Uh, it is coming October, so when I come, I will jump to, they, they, they already working on that. So I feel it's not just uh, starting from very small project, solo project, it can grow maybe to a full uh, uh, production, yes, yeah, full scale production. So uh, I, I see a lot of possibilities from it. Have you seen yet artists? Oh, I'm sorry. No, 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 no. Go on. <laughs> Have you seen yet um, artists who came from different places for residency and then meet each other and say, "Hey, let's work together"? Um, um, uh, or and do you or do you hope to see that? Um, yeah, yeah. We, we try it 
a different way because two, uh, two year, uh, last year we tried to have them all together in one time, in one same month. So they got to work together a lot. But this year we tried to separate them. So we have events like year round, mm -hmm. always have some presentation. But we missed that part from last year. So because it is a very new program, mm -hmm. so we're still trying to uh, figure out how to adjust it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes. It's exciting to think but, what might come. But they, they op their time overlap a little bit. So it's like somebody will help out with the other's project. Well, I was going to respond to the, the idea of creating artwork myself. And um, I mean, I don't get into my studio as much, but then I also realize the whole thing that I'm creating is a piece of choreography. So that my whole involvement with Bellows Falls, whether it's with the housing or not, it goes back to trying to look at any situation we're involved in and working with that situation creatively. I mean, even when I go to the supermarket, you never know if you're going to have some fantastic conversation with the person in front of you about something that could go somewhere else, or it might just be a mundane, how's the weather? But you know, the, op the possibility, the opportunity, the possibility is always in the present. And so the work that I do is very bright, abstract painting. And um, it's, so it's not a technically based thing that, oh my God, I haven't been doing it for a while, I've lost this touch. It's more when I go into the studio, if I've been handling my life creatively, the paintings just flow. You know, they just flow when I'm there. So, um, you know, it's, I find the environment of Bellows Falls to be incredibly rich and creative. And ironically, um, I also, I, Bello, not ironically, Bellows Falls is a very urban place. Mm. I mean, I can walk to everything I need to do. There's days I never get in an automobile, and that's how it was when I lived in a neighborhood in New York. You know, and so it, you know, people laugh at me, and I, I think I don't think I've seen any city as collaged in, as Bellows Falls. I compare it to Rome, Italy, where you look at a piece of architecture against the sky, against a decaying piece of architecture, against this. It's a very, very rich urban environment. Mm. Yeah, I think that's a, uh, even Brattleboro. I mean, it's a it's exactly. a city for two blocks. This whole yeah. industrial yeah. history of yeah. of the Connecticut River is, is amazing yeah. industrial history. So uh, asking you to put um, humility and modesty aside, do you think, um, uh, Robert, that your, your um, work has um, moved the needle as far as people recognizing um, you know, the value of arts and, and creatives in uh, the whole larger uh, economic and cultural and community perspective of the, of the state? And um, you know, is what you did in, in Bellows Falls um, um, you know, what, what impact did that have? Well, I think it certainly got a lot of um, recognition. Um, you know, we are, I mean, Bells Falls is really very much in Brattleboro, very much on the radar screen of the state in a lot of ways, you know, from the Vermont Council on Rural Development to the, you know, the Division for Historic Preservation and Commerce and Community Development. I mean, people do have sort of a buzz about Bells Falls. Um, I mean, John, you and I are working right now with an initiative with the Vermont Arts Council on, you know, the Vermont Creative Network. And I think for years and years and years, we've all known that artists, creatives, really um, add to the economic impact of the community. But it's been very hard for us as, as art organizations to kind of get those figures together. You know, you'll see a report um, come out of any organization, and they'll mention agricultural, they'll mention this, but they don't rarely mention the arts. Mm -hmm. And um, over the last five or six years, particularly the New England Foundation for the Arts has really been tracking figures. And, it, and as we look at Vermont, Vermont artists or creatives in the broadest sense probably are accountable for 9% of the jobs in Vermont. Mm -hmm. And that's probably more jobs than agriculture contributes to the state. Yet, so we're now really working on, here are real figures, here are hard facts. These things around the arts need to be mentioned and highlighted in these reports. So that's one of the aims of what we're trying to do with the Vermont Creative Network in our zone, and then working with organizations, uh, collaborating with them, working with the uh, Brattleboro Development Credit Corporation, with Wyndham Regional, you know, with reports and stuff, you know, addressing how the arts are involved. 
I'd love to open uh, up for some questions from the audience. Don't be shy. <laughs> This is your of one good chance. Um, while we're waiting for people to answer <laughs> your questions, um, could you tell us what you're working on now, or artistically, and, and um, okay, uh, as maybe future plans for the colony too? Yes. Uh, in very quickly coming in October, we collaborated a work with a dance company, so it's a combination uh -huh. of puppetry and dance will be premiered uh, the second weekend in October. <laughs> and uh, in the end of October, we have the Mother Courage thing. And also, it's a collaboration between uh, the, the, the governmental uh, art park, uh, because they, there was a old paper factory. Now it has been used, just renovate to be used uh, for art. So we cooperating with that uh, cultural park, and uh, we will do our show there. Mm. And uh, yeah, and mid November we have our second festival, and the next year we will going to do a show with uh, traditional symphony orchestra. Mm. So they will uh, play live on stage, and we do uh, puppetry. Uh, it will be like an opera style. Mm -hmm. It's our first time to try mm -hmm. opera. <laughs> so I think we do a lot of challenging projects mm -hmm. yeah, along the way. And uh, mm, yeah, we, we uh, starting from this year, we're hosting summer camps. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, next year, we will continue doing summer camps and uh, workshops open to public. and. Like every year, we also host like oh, this coming late October. We have so many things <laughs> in October. Yeah. We hosting Natasha Bilova from Brussels doing the two week uh, workshop, uh, yeah, building puppet workshop. Yeah. So uh, yeah, tr uh, get to our uh, Facebook page. <laughs> yeah, like us, and uh, you will see much much happening now. Mm. Yeah, in Taiwan. So uh, you can just buy ticket and fly to Taiwan. <laughs> <laughs> How many permanent members of the colony are there? I mean, obviously there's you and some of your staff here. How many people are actually? Uh, we have uh, in total 19 full-time oh, members. Yeah. So five of them are for the colony, uh -huh. and 14 of them from Papi and its double. Mm. Yes. Mm -hmm. But uh, we do. It's a like, very mixture way of working. Mm -hmm. Everybody do everything. Yes. Do, you, uh, do you consider, do you think, do you use the name of the in inclusiveness in your programs? And can you, if, if so, can you tell us a little bit about that? Mm, the program? Uh, inclusiveness. Sorry. If you know, if this is the subject of the festival, right? Is it a mirror some way in, in, in your way or in your reflection about your work? Mm, you mean the theme for the festival? Yeah, in, where, where? Sorry, I didn't find Inclusiveness? I don't know, uh, inclusiveness. Um, inclusiveness. Um, no barriers um, oh, to people we, um, being able to enjoy and, 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 and work. Including? Including oh, you mean people. the festival? Yeah. No, um, no, no, I mean your work. Oh. Do you consider this as a theme for some of your projects or some, you know? Yeah, yeah. And uh, we are quite open to all the different topics and uh, collaboration. Yeah, we, I think we are very open because through all this year, we, we did production like range from two puppeteers to 20 puppeteers in different scales. And also we, we try like uh, our classic novel or Western novel or fairy tale, or we hire some script writer to work with us. So I think we are very open to all the project. And recently we got many groups. They are not public groups, they, but they came to us. They said, oh, maybe we can do something together. So recently we started to do a lot of collaboration with uh, like uh, music company or dance company. And I think in the near future, maybe like the, the, the high technology <laughs> people, they will come to us too, maybe. Yeah. Let me rephrase this yeah. question. Uh, uh, 
ask a little bit some different aspect of the same kind of subject because you know this is something uh, as I see in the um, United States, right? You have uh, people of this color, people of that color, people of this ancestry, people of that ancestry. Do you uh, recognize something like this in, in your own native culture? Uh, yes, yes, we do, do have some problem like uh, we have many, many immigrants from Southeast East Asian country uh -huh. and the people in Taiwan, they look down to their uh -huh. culture, they, yeah. So like uh, the show we did uh, last year, it's about like immigrant laborers who were not treated well. So yeah, we, we do have I think, uh, uh, yeah, we do have this kind of problems uh -huh. and uh, some, yeah, like social problems with, uh, we divided people to different groups, uh -huh. or you belong uh -huh. intellectuals, you are farmers, you are labor, you are truck drivers, you are, yes, there's certain expectation of all the careers. But I really like uh, every time, I think every time Eric uh, deliver the open space. He always say this festival is open to whoever wants to join as an audience. I will <laughs> copy that. <laughs> 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 I use that in the future. I think it's a very good concept. Mm -hmm. sure. yes. Absolutely. Thank you. Yes. So we, we want to like uh, embrace like. Uh, truck drivers because they don't usually go to a show <laughs> in Taiwan. Then uh -huh. I think never or yes, people clean the street or those. I think some of uh, some of the community who come visit the village, I think especially fathers, uh, they, they are surprised that that there there are things that their their kids can play with creatively. Uh -huh. And also they are surprised that oh wow, I mean it's like I don't just get to see this from the West, I mean from television, yeah, I, I can experience this with, uh, I mean it's like fathers, especially Chinese fathers, they always very, have that wall and that ego, it's like I'm like the breadwinner, I, I, I don't do this type of things, yeah, so it's, it's very surprising for me to see fathers put their hands and work creatively, yeah, that's very interesting. Oh, nice. yeah. I think we had a question here. Yeah, kind of along those lines, do you have any thing formal of, or a process for newcomers when people arrive? How, how do you make them um, feel welcome, but also how do you orient them to the norms of your community? And especially if there is a language barrier uh, um. at all. Yes, we do have a process like people send the application and they got a step, a step to come. But of course, when they come, we have uh, some information prepared for them about transportation <coughs> or the local map or yeah. And uh, <coughs> we, but uh, we first will listen to what they want to do here, mm. and we try to find a way to guide them to the right person or to the right place. Yes, and uh, mm, yeah, and uh, we, we would say to them it will be like a 30, 20 to 30 minutes presentation, work in progress, so don't be very stressed about mm. it. Mm. It's a, more about what you feel, feel here and you express it through puppetry. Mm. Yes, so <coughs> yeah, mm -hmm. but it's not too difficult this year because we have like uh, one or two coming each month, so we can really yeah talk to and them personally. <laughs> yeah. And, and last person. year we had we had Jui. Oh, Jui don't. Uh, she's an artist from Thailand. Thailand. Yeah, she doesn't have any puppetry background, mm -hmm. and then she just jumped into it. And because Jai mm -hmm. really loves her her concept and her idea. And she used to uh, design posters and pamphlets. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And she designed for our uh, festival poster this oh, year. Okay. Yes. yes, I think this is, will be the last one. Mm -hmm. So, why did you choose Mother Courage as your next production? Uh, actually, it's a project they, the Mexican group, they proposed to us. Mm -hmm. and 
For us, we never try a classic script, and it's the topic of war is all, always less touched in Taiwan because I think we are a small island. We live quite like a calm and peaceful life there. And war for us is like uh, 70 or 80 years ago. And, uh, and now young people are not familiar with that. So we end that show for teenagers because we found nowadays with all the internet, t uh, the games, mm -hmm. the, the very attractive mm -hmm. games, they, they just uh, uh, fall into that world but they neglect what's happening around the world because we are very separate we are an island so we want we think this might be a good project to uh, we we will do a exhibit uh, with the uh, the production there will be exhibit uh, focused on how people suffer from war mm -hmm. and the refugee problem so young people get more uh, sensitive to what's happening around the world. Yeah. I think the other thing also the vision for from Chaing and the company is uh, we create, we make, we make a show, uh, create a show of a production and at the same time education is very very important. So it's not just oh we just want to do this and we just we just don't care about who are coming and and, and how they can benefit from from the performance or the production. Thank you. I want to thank Diane and Robert and all of you.